Welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with your host, Dr. Nick Vanterhaven, and brought to you by ECG Management Consultants. You can learn more about the show on the program's page at healthcarenowradio.com or on our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud. The U.S. spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country on the planet. So why don't we have superior outcomes? Why haven't the principles of capitalism prevailed? And why do American consumers have so much trouble accessing and paying for healthcare? Each week, Healthcare Upside Down will dive into these and other issues with ECG principal, Dr. Nick, and guest panelists as they discuss the upsides and downsides of healthcare in the US and how to make the system work for everyone. And we end with your better pill to swallow, the conclusion to today's episode with insights on challenges and changes that improve healthcare. Now here's your host, Dr. Nick. Hello, and welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with me, your host, Dr. Nick. This week's episode, Rural Healthcare Rocks. Rural healthcare is a tough marketplace. There are a few standout facilities that have managed to buck the trend, but for many, the struggle to create a viable healthcare business in a difficult market is a challenge. A marketplace that often finds large proportions of the people in the catchment area in poor health and from a lower socio-economic group. That same population is widely dispersed and low density, making economies of scale difficult to find and sustain. For rural healthcare, the facility may be the only one for miles around, leaving the population with limited choices unless they elect to take the long drive to urban facilities that can be hours away. Many rural facilities end up partnering or being acquired by these systems, pushing all care to the urban centres and diminishing the local system. This week, we are challenging the conventional thinking for rural healthcare with my guest today, Scott Cantley, the Chief Executive Officer for the Memorial Health System that is based in Marietta, Ohio, at the base of the Appalachia. It's on the Ohio River on the border of West Virginia with typical patient populations mix and around two hours drive from multiple large urban facilities and 70% of the patients they serve are government insured patients, a difficult area to successfully manage a hospital and stay economically viable. But Scott has found a path to economic and medical success. Scott, thanks for joining me today. Uh, Thanks for having me, Nick. It's it's a pleasure to, to speak with you. So you're in a rural setting. Rural healthcare is a challenging environment to survive in the current sort of aggregation of resources in big cities, people are moving. With that said, we've seen this mass sort of, ex- I don't want to call it exodus because everybody hasn't left the cities, but a lot of people moving out into the rural space. How did you go about creating a rural health? care system that is not just surviving, but it's thriving. What's your secret? You know, first of all, I think uh, every market is very unique in healthcare, but, you know, we do know that healthcare wants to be local. You know, I'm blessed with the geography that I'm in. And and so we had, I think, Nick, uh, unique opportunities were a couple hours away from almost every tertiary system. And so a couple hours drive, as you know, means us uh, more than 100 miles away from almost any tertiary system. And it gave me opportunities to say, if we could build this thing, if we could build healthcare and invest in specialties and, and access points throughout this 100 mile region between us and the, and the tertiaries, that people want to stay closer. They, they're not used to driving beltways and, you know, and, and in the urban metro environment. So they'd love to come to the smaller town and get their health care. They just have to be inspired. Um, they have to be inspired that the quality is there, that, that the specialists are there, that the care they're going to get is equal to what they would have gotten had they driven further. But they're really happy when you can give them that kind of assurance and you, and you can inspire them to stay local but you got to be growing. I mean, you know, these these specialists require larger populations to feed them the volumes they need as you get into more and more, you know, unique types of services. And so um, you you can't sit back on your laurels uh, as a rural health system. You have to be looking at markets and growth and market regions that can feed specialists, because once you make those investments, you've, you've got to have the growth to, to feed them. 
So rural settings and healthcare notoriously difficult to get physicians to even come. I, I mean, we see incentive programs will wipe out medical debt. Those are, you know, a number of programs trying to bring them in. You've managed to do this. What have you been doing? Well, we've done all those things. It is expensive to recruit uh, specialists and physicians, primary care and uh, specialty care into rural settings. But rural settings offer a lot of unique things, Nick. I think, you know, what we've seen is that there is a group of physicians, if you structure the compensation incentives correctly, because there is, unlike the, the more densely populated urban areas where there's a lot of competition, physicians who want to work hard and want to, but want to enjoy the fruits of their labor do really well in rural settings. There's no lack of volume of patients available for them because uh, these are underserved areas. And so if we create the right circumstances, these physicians do very, very well, probably better than their urban counterparts, but we have to work a little differently. And we need uh, physicians who have skill sets and confidence that will allow them to have that broader practice, but work hard and, and be rewarded for that. Well, so you bring up an interesting point, you know, the economics of this You've raised the cost a little bit because you're saying it's more costly to bring them in. But in that urban rural setting, you tend to have a a lower socioeconomic group. I don't know if that's true for you. So less available resources to pay for the healthcare, whether it's, you know, government paid or health insurance paid. How are you balancing that off? I mean, you must be competitive because if you're not, you're not going to survive. Right. It is a very difficult a set of uh, economics in rural settings because, you know, the first thing we realized was without the commercially insured mix of patients, the first thing we had to do was make sure that our physicians weren't penalized by seeing governmentally insured patients, which is the, you know, 70 plus percent of the patients that we serve here every day. So we had to create financial arrangements so that physicians weren't penalized for that payer mix in the rural markets. But, you know, that's part of our mission is to serve everyone. And so we have to make the economics work. And we do that through, you know, a range of, uh, you know, hospital-based employment with a lot of uh, an eye toward how do we create a win-win for the physicians and for the health system to, you know, continue to retain what essentially is growth has to be very procedural focused in, in rural settings. That's where the, you know, the U.S. payment models favor procedural based outpatient growth. And so we're very cognizant as we're growing service lines that we're, you know, we're creating the right set of incentives, but we're also capturing those commercially insured lives that were often going to urban settings in the past for their procedural care, but we're retaining that. And that together, bringing physicians and hospitals together and sharing in that success is what gives us the economics to continue to invest. So it sounds like the sharing piece of that is a critical component that contributes to it. A hundred percent. We think of, of employing physicians as investments we make because we, you, you will lose money on the professional practice side because of the, you know, the payer mix and, you know, all the things that we just spoke of. But if we get the right kind of growth and we capture that and we put it in the right settings of care, outpatient, uh, you know, um, procedural growth, it does help uh, it helps the hospital and the hospital has to be willing to share that success back with its employed physicians. And so um, that culture and that willingness to see the entire pie and how we, how we divide that up um, is what creates, a, a, I think, a vibrant rural healthcare market. So you've managed, I, I think, to stem a, a substantial amount of the flow. You're not a referral base for these external large healthcare facilities. You've built a physician practice, but do you have enough volume? We do. Uh, Often our our problem isn't volume. It's 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 recruiting enough bench depth um, because we're we'll overwhelm our specialists. We um, with volume as patients, you know, we serve um, even though we're in a very small rural market. When you connect these markets together, we serve hundreds of thousands of people who who circulate those practices spread over 50, 60 miles of of small towns with practices embedded across 50, 60 ambulatory sites. Um, And so it's like a, you know, it's a patchwork of access points spread out across a broader geographic region 
who are referring back into a couple of big ambulatory settings for testing and, and you know, diagnostics, et cetera. And then, of course, one major um, procedural center, which is the, you know, the health, the hospital itself. So it, it is a it, it's a complex uh, patchwork of, of providers, ambulatory pro sites, and of course, a, a lot of, of focus on um, healthy procedural growth and retention of business that otherwise would have been flowing to um, the urban markets around us. Right. So I imagine a small rural hospital is seeing all this bleed out there, you know, at risk of being purchased. Um, you know, you're some ways down the journey. I, I, I just imagine this is an overwhelming set of uh, tasks. What did you take on? What was your first steps through this? How would you guide somebody if, if, if somebody <laughs> took you out of your spot and put you in another hospital to do this? Where would you start? The first, the first place you have to start as a rural provider is your physician alignment strategy. That is the absolute key. If you can't harness this physician network and retain that, those referrals and work with your doctors to ensure that they're going to, your primary care team believes in your specialty team and that they won't refer to the universities a couple hours away for you know, those, those high-end procedures that you're going to try to do in a, uniquely in a rural setting. That is your, that's your first step. Um, you, have to, you have to work with your physicians. You have to build their confidence in the quality of care that their patients are going to get. Or, or clearly, physicians are going to do what's in the best interest of their patients. They're never going to feed the business model. They're always going to take care of one patient at a time. And so that physician alignment strategy, that belief, and we're building something together um, that's good for this community, just as it's good for them, is, is the first step in, in creating strategy in a rural system. So, um, you know, for us, uh, you know, mostly that is almost exclusively an employed arrangement that we began to build that relationship with our physicians, but uh, it takes a lot of good physician leadership as well. And then you have to pay a lot of attention to your quality and your service levels and, and, and making access to that system easy for your physicians to, to, to gain. Well, I think one of the challenges, Nick, that a lot of rural systems have is you can get your patients in so much easier in the, you know, in the urban settings because there's more availability, right? And so physicians get really frustrated if, if, uh, if, if it takes two weeks to see a specialist here when they could get their patients in the next day at the university you know, a couple hours away. And so, um, so you, so all those things have to work, the quality of care, the access to care, and then that experience of getting information back to the physicians who referred or retained that. So we work on all those things simultaneously all the time. And, but it's all about treating physicians as partners, not as employees. So that's, uh, that's how we do it. We build it together. So I recognize, you know, uh, build the relationships, demonstrate the value. There's a little bit of a chicken and egg. You've got to sort of have the program and, you know, I, I guess some ramp up time, I guess water under the keel, which would be difficult in your circumstance. But then on an ongoing basis, you've got a challenge relative to employment and incentive because now you've employed people. How do you keep that whole balance. I always hear pushback, you know, oh, the, 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 it, you're just going to default to the lowest common denominator. We're just employed. Nobody's incented to do anything at this point. Mm -hmm. well, I'll tell you one of the first things we did, Nick, that was, I think, very different. I haven't ran into a lot of people who have done this, but we built our entire employed position network without a single non-compete clause. And we have competitors all around us that, you know, try to recruit our doctors and but we, we did that intentionally and purposefully because we say to our physicians, we have to earn this partnership every single day. Nothing keeps you here other than the fact that you believe that this is a great place to practice. And you could leave us tomorrow and go to work for our competitors um, if, if you believe that the value isn't there uh, tomorrow. And so we, we put that pressure on ourselves but it really became about living that. I mean, we had to make it come to life then, right? Because we don't have any, we, you know, we don't get you here and then say, okay, you're stuck. You bought a house in this little market and, and you can't, you know, you can't, unless you leave altogether, you, you know, you can't stay. It really was about making sure that, that we live that. And so that was a, that was a starting point for us in making sure that we were great partners to our doctors. The rest of that then becomes about 
you you know you have to create the right in, uh, incentives and the right compensation models and like i say i think you have to be generous with your physicians because they really are the ones that make create the success that doesn't mean we still are bound by fair market value and all the other compensation terms and models out there we we have everything vetted by third parties in our in our compensation relationships with our physicians but you also can't have be one sided it has to be a shared success model and so um, we're careful about making sure we, we incentivize quality. Um, we reward physicians for achieving excellence in quality, just as we reward them for, for achieving um, the volume that, uh, you know, that their practices yield. And so, you know, all those, uh, we, try to, we try to put them all out there for our physicians, knowing that when you have successful physicians, you'll have a successful health system. Right. And not even just a successful health system, you're getting successful care because happy physicians equals happy patients from the most part in my sort of uh, experience. One of the things that I've seen repeatedly challenging in uh, these rural areas is the lack of available capital to invest, particularly in technology, yet technology is now becoming increasingly important to sort of help smooth the process I imagine that that was uh, a you know similar problem for you. How did you solve that? I don't know. If we ever solved that. I'd like to have a lot more uh, more resources than I have, certainly. But I agree with you. I think it is about balancing. I mean, physicians, you know, particularly specialists, they need great tools to work with, and you can't put them in a, you know, you can't leave them with 1950s technology in the ORs. Um, and expect them to produce, uh, you know, cutting edge results today. And so there is a, there is a certain level of investment, but Nick, I'd say that that is about having a growth strategy. You know, as you add, I, I told our, our hospital leadership board, when we first started investing in oncologists and we started employing the oncologist and the, and the subspecialist that went with that, I said, you, you're making a decision today to no longer be a community hospital. You're going to be a regional referral center. So you have to start thinking beyond our little town into this broader region because you're going to need those patients. And we're going to have to create service lines now that draw people in from from areas we didn't serve before. And that's been true with every specialty. I mean, so our access to capital is facilitated by ongoing growth. And so, uh, you know, doing innovative things requires you to be, you know, the, the, the pressure is the execution. Can you retain and continue to grow and add to your margins so that you're able to continue to access those capital markets. Um, we've also found innovative ways of, of partnering with develop, developing partners and you know other, other ways to continue to invest without having it all sit on the balance sheet until recently some, some gap rules changed even that. But it's always, uh, you, you've got to be creative and, and, but you're right, you've got to invest your way and growth is the key to being able to afford the next set of investments that, uh, you know, healthcare demands today. Do do you see a future where it's flipped and no longer patients are are leaving the rural setting? And in fact, the urban folks are coming to the rural setting because it's a better experience. I I mean, I'm listening to you and I'm going, it certainly sounds like it. I'm, I'm sold on this. Well, no, I don't know that we'll ever see people leaving the big academic urban, you know, brands and, and flowing down just like a, you know, for healthcare in a, in a rural market. I think people want to be near their homes. I mean, when you think of your own experiences with healthcare, it is kind of a, it's a play about, you know, someone's admitted to the hospital, but your life kind of stops. You put everything on hold for that, you know, week, month, quarter, where you're dealing with this acute event. And, um, and so your family rallies around you and people are trying to be with you. I, I think that always, bodes that you want to be as close to home as you can so that the rest of your life can be normal as you deal with this, uh, you know, health crisis. So I, I think, uh, you know, you've got to think about where do people want to come to get health care? And in rural markets, I think I've seen the unfortunate trend that as hospitals get acquired, they become entry points and primary care stations for the motherships in, di- in more distant uh, cities. And unfortunately, I think that's a sad, you know, that that's a sad omen for you know where healthcare is going if you if you happen to live in that in the rural parts of this country and i think we need to push back and we need to we need to demand more of ourselves and not just uh you know not just throw in the towel and so to me that's what that's why you have to invest you have to bring specialists you have to do these things if you're going to survive 
Otherwise, you're just going to be an entry portal for, you know, for, you know, some partner institution in a, in a more urban, densely populated region of, of your area. So making healthcare local part of, uh, you know, your concept around this physician alignment, central tenant, the making the economics. And it sounds very much like for every, I, I, almost as if your decisions are harder because you've got less resources and you really have to focus on that. I, I'm wondering, do you have everybody at the table? Are the physicians represented in that process? How do they sort of participate in this? Is that a good experience? Should everybody be doing that? Well, I do think, you know, that this concept of physicians as partners, I think physicians need to be the architects of, of healthcare. I mean, they are the clinical decision makers from the ground up. And while you have a few, uh, you know, executives like me that help, you know, build the organizational systems to make that happen, it's really physicians that make all these decisions about what we should be doing and, and what do we have enough volume to do. We looked at interventional neurology, for, for example, um, for stroke, and we just couldn't make the numbers work. We don't have enough volume that this, there's no way, even if we captured 100% of, the, of what we thought would be our potential catchment area, for that service line, there just wasn't enough volume to do it well and to, you know, and to keep those skills up. And so, um, you know, there'll be things that you can't do no matter, you know, I, ha I happened at the time to have a neurosurgeon that was in, had an interest in that, but I, you know, it takes more than one. And then one, you know, once you start dividing out that volume, you just can't, you can't make those numbers work all the time. So I think uh, absolutely. You'll always keep your physicians at the table. Leadership, physician leadership is critical. Um, having the right infrastructure for physician leadership, but the right people in the in the in those roles is is absolutely essential to um, having a robust growth strategy in particular, which is I, I agree a hundred percent you know a part of the the recipe for success for rural markets. When when you stop growing, I think you you will see that you know you're you're going to be looking at bad choices down the road because the economics in in rural markets just don't support a no growth environment or a stable environment. So basically we have rural healthcare that has been, I, I want to say a laggard for years, if not decades, they have economic challenges. They service, you know, a lower socioeconomic group. And I'm sat here thinking, actually the future sounds pretty bright, not easy for, for, for all of the challenges that are associated with that, but there's clearly a pathway. It's associated with that partnership arrangement with physicians and the team that essentially builds that. And then very targeted uh, approaches to different markets. You talk about one that you, I, I don't want to say decline, that's probably the not not the right word but you you refer out i imagine right and you relate you create the relationships but for everything that you can and i assume you continue to expand yeah we're continuing to, to expand and continuing to talk to the look at the adjacent markets and saying you know how far um how far can we move out beyond our the the core and still expect that patients would prefer to drive here to a rural setting as opposed to be referred to a, one of the urban settings. And I, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that a lot of my urban colleagues forget about is if you live in an urban setting, you're comfortable there. But if you live in a rural setting and you're asked to now navigate, in addition to worry about all the other things that I've got to worry about, getting surgery, my recovery, my family being with me, and I'm going to do it in a place that I don't even know where I'm going. Even my nav system, I'm not even comfortable driving in that kind of congestion. When you offer people an opportunity to stay in a in a market where their comfort their comfort level is already there, and I haven't added any stress, they will consistently choose to stay local and rural for their care if they have an option that they believe in. And so that's our advantage. That's how we keep the, these rural markets. It's you can't you can't sacrifice quality. They have to be inspired that they're going to get great care. And so their physician needs to believe in that too, because it's their physician who's telling them they have great specialists. They have a great neurosurgeon even there in, in Marietta. I know it's small, but they have a great neurosurgery program, or they have a great cardiac program. And um, you don't have to go to to for us. It's Columbus or Cleveland, even though. You know, you've got world-class healthcare in those cities, 
but people would prefer to stay here if they think the quality is there and they don't have to, to navigate all that, that congestion. So that's our advantage, but it's the physicians we have to, you know, that have to help us create that trust level that patients will stay local. And then I have to look at those markets around us and say, they're used to driving other places. How do I get them to, to want to stay here? But again, it's a once, once they're inspired, um, that the quality's there, uh, they'll make the choice to stay in, a, in an environment they're comfortable because this is where they live. They live in, in small towns. Exciting times. Scott, thank you for joining me today. Nick, it's a pleasure talking to you about what I live every day. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing us some attention to the, the difficulties that these rural markets have, but I think there are solutions. Rural healthcare really does rock. You can have your cake and eat it. A thriving, economically successful rural healthcare system to service the flight to rural living that has been influenced by the pandemic. An expanding rural healthcare system building more facilities, expanding access for the wider population, and delivering competitive satisfaction and patient pleasing services. In this tough market, a wide open strategy for physicians without barriers like non compete clauses. Your better pill to swallow for better healthcare services and solutions starts with sharing. Seeing your physicians as an investment and building the right compensation packages and incentives for your marketplace and population so that everyone buys in, everyone shares in the economic success. Thanks for joining me, your host, Dr. Nick, on this week's edition of Healthcare Upside Down. Until next week, keep solving the business of healthcare as if your life depended on it, as one day soon, it will. That's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite listening platform by searching for Healthcare Now Radio. Also, check out our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud for summaries and commentary from each episode. Follow our show's social hashtag, HC Upside Down. And join us each week as we work to solve the business of healthcare for everyone.